we're joined by Charles Lipson. He's Professor Emeritus of Political Science at the University of Chicago and also a columnist at The Spectator. Professor Lipson, thank you very much for joining us, first of all. And we'll get to Nikki Haley shortly. But first, I have to ask you about the rematch between Biden and Trump. Looks all but certain. What do you see the Biden and Trump campaign teams doing next? I mean, as far as I can tell, Trump has been calling America a failed state, full of enemies within. Well, Biden seems to have a messaging problem despite an OK economy and some policy wins. I think you've gotten it pretty, pretty right, uh, Arnold. Uh, uh, here's the way I see it. I think that the main theme of the campaign will be don't vote for the other guy. He's dangerous. That is, it will be a negative campaign. Uh, I think that each uh, of the candidates has problems, some problems within his own party. You you raised some of those around uh, Nikki Haley uh, and the vote for her, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But Biden's problem is really um, consolidate, within his party, his problem is consolidating uh, support among progressives who are very unhappy about um uh, the Biden administration's general support for Israel, not unequivocal support, but general support for Israel. Uh, and uh, But the more he moves to satisfy the progressives, the harder it will be for him to bring along the great middle of the country, which is uh, neither uh, to the right nor to the left. Mm. Hey, Professor, so Nikki Haley... Uh, is out. Uh, she stopped short of endorsing Trump, though. I mean, what do you think she'll do next? Uh, where do you expect her supporters to go now? Well, I, I think uh, I never expected her to endorse Trump right away. There'll be negotiations. For example, does she get a speaking role at the convention? Those kinds of things. Uh, but I think that there are some uh, significant policy differences between uh, Haley herself and Donald Trump. It's important to recognize, however, that if Haley in uh, Haley will eventually endorse a Trump, I'm almost certain. And the reason for that is that it will be hard for her to run as a Republican in the future if she doesn't endorse the nominee of her party this year. Um, but her role in the future will depend a lot upon whether the vice presidential candidate that Trump uh, nominates uh, becomes uh, the front runner uh, for the next election. That will depend upon whether Trump it, himself is elected. He is what we call a lame duck as soon as he is elected. That is, he can't run for another term because of our Constitution. So whoever he appoints as vice president will be in a strong position to lead the Republican Party into the next election. Just staying with Haley, uh, I mean, President Biden also made a clear appeal to her supporters in the aftermath of her exit. On what issues do you think Biden can sort of persuade some of her voters to come to his side? Are there any areas of potential overlap? Oh, yes. Uh, but again, I think a lot of those are negative areas. For example, um, there's been a decline or flatness in real income in the United States. Uh, it, it went up under Trump. People had better economic performance under Trump and were happier about it. Uh, there's been a huge influx of illegal immigration in the country. That's been extremely expensive for the cities that have to take care uh, of the welfare impact. Uh, but it's also split the Democratic coalition because a number of African Americans in major cities end up competing with these illegal immigrants for jobs and for uh, public resources. It's also been actually a problem for legal Hispanics in the United States. Uh, they're not happy with this large number of illegal immigrants. And I think Biden also has a huge problem in terms of his health. And the public mm. notices it. He, he is not the same man that he was even four years ago when he ran. He's in a much weaker position. So going back to your question, I think a lot of the appeals 
uh, to the Haley voters will be not so much Donald Trump is absolutely your man, but rather Joe Biden is not your man. Prof. Lipson, just want to ask you about those Haley numbers uh, in a bit more detail, if I may. There were maybe about 25, 30 percent in places like Vermont, North Carolina. Not a whole lot, you know, for a GOP primary. But I've been told that, look, when it comes to a general election, that could make a big difference. Would you agree? Absolutely. Um, your audience should be aware that in the U.S. general election, uh, it is a state by state election. So if you win Michigan or North Carolina by one vote, and that's certified as, as legally correct, then you win the whole state and all of the electoral uh uh, votes that it has in that state. And a number of these states, five, six, seven, were very close last time. And that's where uh, the, uh, the election will be fought out this year in Arizona, North Carolina, uh, Georgia, Pennsylvania, and there are a few others. So uh, that's where it'll be fought. And so it matters that you bring in uh, all of Nikki Haley's uh, uh, voters, if you're uh, Donald Trump, it matters to Joe Biden that he bring in the people who uh, voted uncommitted and so forth. It will matter if there's a third party candidate who will draw away votes more from one side or the other, depending upon whether it's more liberal candidate or more conservative. So a, a lot of things could happen uh, between now and then, but uh, people are expecting a close race. And even though right now it looks like Trump is ahead in the polls, uh, uh, it's, it's a long way uh, to Tipperary. Mm -hmm. And Professor, I want to get your thoughts on Mr. Biden's State of the Union. I mean, maybe the president's the largest audience before November. If you're to advise him, what will he need to present to allay concerns over his you know, fitness for office be, be because of his age? Absolutely. I think one of the things that he will uh, need to do is show that he can actually speak for more than 25 or 30 minutes and not stumble. Uh, he, he was unwilling to do that. There, there was a tradition before the biggest sporting event in America, the Super Bowl, that the president is interviewed. The president didn't do it last year because uh, he didn't like the network. But this year it was a friendly network, and he still didn't do the interview. And he's not doing any um, he's not doing any interviews with the press and so forth. So it, it seems as if he's quite unwilling uh, to put himself in a position where he has to do something impromptu. Uh, he'll be reading this time uh, from a teleprompter, but I think he's got to say something serious about what he's going to do about immigration. He's got to say something uh, that will allay uh, um, citizens' concerns about crime. He's got to say something about uh, the towering deficits we have. There are a lot of problems. Uh, and it's also worth noting that he's never really gone out and made the case to the public about mm -hmm. why we should support Ukraine in the major war that we're we're supporting um and of course there's a need for a lot of american expenditures for defense in the asia pacific and he's not been able to make that case he hasn't even tried so i think there are a lot of concerns here all right professor we are out of time but thank you very much fascinating and very insightful conversation charles lipson is professor emeritus of political science at the university of chicago and also a columnist at The Spectator. Thank you, sir.